Let's transform this one liter PC we bought cheap off of eBay into a killer low power home lab or SMB server. By the time we're done, we're gonna have plenty of cores, 96 gigabytes of memory, eight terabytes of NVMe storage. This thing's even gonna have 10 gigabit ethernet. Even with all that, this thing is gonna spend most of its days virtually silent, just sipping power. Yeah, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is an HP Elite 600 G9. You may have seen our review as part of our tiny mini micro series where we look at the one liter PCs from Lenovo, HP, and Dell and we review them as they could be both desktops but also home lab nodes. What we haven't done recently is we have not shown folks what you can do with these things if you want to turn them into an awesome home lab node. So I thought, well, why don't we do that with this? So in this video, we have four terabyte SSDs. We have 48 gigabyte SO DIMMs. Yes, they are a thing. We also have 10 gig and two and a half gig ethernet adapters. And we're gonna show you how to do all of this and turn this little system into something that is completely awesome. And I just wanna say thank you real quick to the STH YouTube members who made making something like this possible by supporting STH so we can go and buy all the components that we put in here so we can show you something that's awesome. And I think the home lab folks are gonna absolutely love this. With that, let's get to it. Okay, so starting out, why don't we just look at this unit, how it came real quick. Uh, so first thing you're gonna notice is that we do have a Core i7. This is the Core i7 12700T. So it's a 35 watt TDP processor. The 35 watts I think is super important because frankly, with a lot of home lab nodes, it really doesn't matter if you have a much faster CPU. What you want is really a lower power CPU because you know you don't wanna pay those electric bills for a higher power one. And also the lower power CPUs tend to yield lower noise and stuff. And so you just don't wanna hear them, right? And you'll see that this thing was nearly silent in our Project Tiny Mini Micro Review. And that's why we're using this as a base. Beyond the Core i7 though, there really wasn't much more to the system. I mean, we got it for only a little over $500 on eBay, but we didn't really get a lot of extra features. But the nice thing is getting inside these systems, they are super serviceable. It's one screw, you pop the cover off, and now you're inside. And taking a look at what we got for just a little over $500, uh, there's a couple things. So first off, uh, the memory in these is always kind of a bummer, right? We got a single channel of DDR5, and it's only a 16 gigabyte DIMM in there. So so that's okay, but we're gonna upgrade that. And I'm gonna show you a couple options. It'd be nice if we actually could put this nicely. And then on the SSD side, there's one slot that was just not occupied. And then on the other slot, there's a 512 gig NVMe SSD that's not very fast, let's just be honest. And so what I thought was, why don't we take this unit and I'm just gonna show you what I would do to make something that's better in two different flavors. The first one is what I call kind of more of a value conscious one. Now there are three things that we're gonna use that are in common between these builds. First, we're gonna use just the overall shell. Second, we're gonna use the Intel AX211. That gives us our Wi-Fi 6E option. And then the other thing is just the processor. Now we're gonna use Proxmox, but if you were gonna use the VMware Lab, I would say actually just get the Core i5 with all P cores instead of having the P and E cores. VMware is not planning on supporting heterogeneous cores in a, or, you know, for at least a while, they told me. So I would say stick with homogeneous Genius cores with VMware, but heterogeneous cores, so P plus E cores if you're gonna get anything else or you're gonna use anything else. Okay, so first off, I think the, the first configuration, which is easiest, is just however it comes, right? You don't have to spend a lot more. And frankly, it is much less expensive to get anything in a used system than it usually is to upgrade later. But that starting point with the used system also can be quite interesting. So for example, um, you know, this system has a total of 16 gigabytes in a single DIM. Now, what I would personally do is upgrade this to a second 16 gig DIM and give 32 gigabytes, which I think is darn good. But if you wanna go a step further, you can get two 32 gig DIMs and throw them in here. And that gives you 64 gigabytes of memory, which makes this a very capable node. So I'm gonna do that right now. And that said, it takes less than a minute to go install two 32 gig DIMs, and they're pretty easy to find, frankly. Now, once that's done, the next question is, what are we gonna do for networking? Frankly, the one gig networking plus the Wi-Fi is okay, but I think we could do something a little bit better. And so for that, we're gonna pop out the little uh, HP FlexIO V2 module, which has uh, two USB ports, which I love USB ports, but we're not gonna use them here. And instead what we're gonna use is we're gonna use a two and a half gig ethernet module. Now, if you wanna find the model numbers for all this stuff, we're gonna have them linked in the description, but we'll also have main site articles and, and forms post where all the stuff is. So you can learn a little bit more about like, you know, what these are and what have you. Okay, so when you have the FlexIO V2 module, what you're gonna do is you just basically pop this little sucker in 
and it pops in like this and we're already there with our two and a half gig ethernet port. So now we have a one gig ethernet port along with a two and a half gig ethernet port. We have 64 gigabytes memory. That's pretty good, but let's go a step further and let's just go add another SSD. Okay, so for this, we're gonna go and add a four terabyte Rocket 4 Plus Sabre and SSD. These things are very fast. I just wanna point out one thing real quick, uh, which is William who uh, does the marketing for Sabre now used to be our SSD reviewer on the STH main site. And uh, so that's how we got these drives and that's why we're using them. There are of course other options, but uh, why not, why not use something fun and fast because Bill sent them. And to install, you literally just go pull up the little thermal flap, you pop it in, and then uh, then it's one screw. Woo! Okay, so now after our arduous three minutes of installing stuff, we have a 12 core 20 thread Core i7 processor. We have 64 gigabytes of memory, a half terabyte boot NVMe SSD, a four terabyte data SSD. And in terms of networking, we have one gigabit ethernet, two and a half gig ethernet, and then also Wi-Fi 6E. This is absolutely plenty. And frankly, this is a great desktop as well as a Proxmox or other kind of, you know, Linux, Ubuntu, whatever, virtualization server. This thing is absolutely awesome at this point. So why don't we go one step further and that's what we're gonna do next. So let's start again with the RAM, 64 gigabytes, that's not enough and it's nowhere even close to being enough. So we gotta go up there. Okay, so for the memory, instead of these 32 gig SODIMs, we're gonna use these right here, which are Mushkin Redline non-binary DIMMs. And what we mean by non-binary is that the capacity is not a power of two. Instead of being one, two, four, eight, 16, 32 gig DIMMs, these DIMMs are 48 gigabytes each. So we have uh, these non-binary ones. So we get two 48 gig DIMMs for 96 gigabytes of memory. Oh, that was really hard, right? No, no, it was super easy. Okay, uh, now these, uh, now we have our 96 gigs of memory installed. And something that, you know, a lot of folks don't know is that this system will actually recognize the non-binary memory. I know a lot of folks, uh, these things are very new and sometimes you know, some of the big OEM systems don't recognize this stuff right out of the box, but this did. So I was really surprised with that. And it's just something that's kind of nice. Okay, now that's done. Let's talk about storage for a sec. Now we already have that four terabyte drive in there, but what if we went a little bit bigger? What if, uh, what if instead of doing a four terabyte drive, we did a mirrored four terabyte setup. This is a DRAMless SSD, not very fast. And so I figure why even use that? Instead, let's go pull out another Sabre Rocket 4 Plus uh, four terabyte drive. Now you could use eight terabyte SSDs, of course, in this, but those tend to be a lot more on a cost per terabyte basis. And that's why we're using four terabyte drives. It's the same reason actually that we're using the Core i7 instead of the Core i9. There is one thing though on, uh, on something like this that's really important that's different in the system. So when you have uh, one of these SSDs, you're gonna see with a four terabyte SSD, we have components both on the top as well as the bottom. And you might ask, well, why does that matter? Well, HP had by default these like little, Oh, these little thermal pads that are in here. And uh, with these little thermal pads, you, you can't actually put this SSD and have it lie properly. So what you have to do is actually pull out the little thermal pad and then you can go and install this thing very, very easily. Now this system can support two pretty darn fast PCI Gen 4 SSDs like we have here. But I do wanna just point out that I think a lot of folks will want lower speed SSDs, especially when you have two of them, just because, um, you know, frankly, this is gonna be a little bit more of a struggle to cool for the system than the lower power, lower speed SSDs. SSDs. Okay, so let's talk about networking. We already have our 96 gigs of memory. We have eight terabytes of NVMe SSDs that are gonna be really cool when we show you how we're gonna set them up. But then, uh, you know, the networking kind of is not great, right? We have the Intel one gig NIC that's kind of standard on the motherboard, but then we have this Flex IO NIC, um, which, you know, is, is okay at two and a half gig, but we want something faster than two and a half gig, right? Well. What about if there was 10 gig? And I'll just show you these side by side. Uh, this is the two and a half gig. This is the 10 gig. You'll see that we actually have larger connectors on the 10 gig one. So these are only for, I think they might work on the G6 and now like G8, G9 systems. So if you want to go back, you can totally go back and, and install these. But this is a Marvell, a Quantinic. We'll have the part number, of course, down below. And you can buy these things and put them directly into the system very easily. Now we're probably going to use Brian's hands for installing this with some B-roll. So thank you to Brian for doing that. You pretty much just line it up, put it in place and you're ready to go. And as some bonus content, if you want to print a 3D bracket, you can actually do a project like installing this InnoDisk N.2 to 10 GBase T adapter and get a second 10 gigabit ethernet port. 
We'll have more on this on the STH main site, but it is possible we're just not gonna do it for our main build. Okay, so for a quick recap, we have our 12 core Core i7 processor, 96 gigs of memory. We have eight terabytes in two four terabyte NVMe SSDs. And these are PCIe Gen 4, so they are wicked fast. And then we also have our 10 gig ethernet, our one gig ethernet, and we have our Wi-Fi 6E. So the next thing is like, let's go install an OS on this. And for this, I wanna install Proxmox. We've been using Proxmox since I think like 2013, 2014 or something like that. So almost a decade in production, in co-location. And I have some thoughts on how I would set this up versus some other options out there. Okay, now it's time to set up Proxmox and this follows the normal Proxmox install. There are two things though I wanna point out that we're gonna do. The first one is that we're gonna set our boot to a ZFS mirror, right? Because it's really a good idea to have some kind of mirror in your home lab. You may not want to do that and you may frankly not care if you are just like, hey, I'm gonna back everything up. I just want the maximum capacity. You could do these two drives drives in RAID 0 and have 8 terabytes. You could go up to 8 terabyte drives, have up to 16 terabytes. There are a whole bunch of different things you could do for a little system like this. Still, just because uh, I always run Proxmox in RAID 1 for boot drives, that's what we're going to do here. Now, the second thing is super important, and that's that you want to make sure that the IP address and the NIC that you're using for your setup is the 1 gigabit Ethernet, not the 10 gigabit NIC. The reason for that is I personally really like to have an out of band ish management port that I can go and connect to a dedicated management network. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use that one gig network for our management, getting to that management interface, logging in via SSH, also doing things like doing all the updates and all that kind of stuff you would wanna do. And we're gonna do that on the one gig NIC. Now, once we're in Proxmox, that doesn't mean that we're not gonna use that 10 gigabit ethernet. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna log on, we're gonna do all of our normal setup stuff. Okay, now before we do any of the virtual machines, what I wanna do real quick is I wanna create a network bridge. We're gonna create that network bridge in Proxmox on that 10 gig ethernet port. Now, this is something that a lot of folks get confused confused with, but the way to think about it is we just want to expose that 10 gig ethernet port to the world. We don't necessarily need this thing to have its IP address because we're not going to be addressing the machine via that port. Now, if you're using OVS, it's a pretty similar process, but we're gonna do the easy mode and just do the Linux bridge here. Okay, now let's just go through the process of creating a VM as an example. And this one we're just gonna use as a Docker host. This could be a Kubernetes host. It could just be a normal VM, whatever you want. Now, the first thing that we need to do is we need to go and get an Ubuntu image on here. So we've just done that. Now, since we did so many hardware upgrades, we get a ton of really cool features when we go build this VM. For our storage, we can put this on the ZFS RAID 1 array. So we just have automatically, you know, mirrored storage on here, that's super easy. In terms of memory, we can add a ton of memory and actually a pretty good amount of CPU as well. We're gonna put our networking set to the bridge that is associated with our 10 gig ethernet network because that's obviously the one that we want all of our VMs to have access to if we want them to go fast. And that was super easy. Other fun things you could do with this, there are things like LXC containers for doing a file share, an easy NFS file share. You can also set up things like Samba NFS, all that kind of stuff right on the ZFS shares as bare metal, but it also might be a little bit easier to manage file sharing using an LXC container or a VM. Since we have four terabytes of storage, you have plenty to go and do things like just have a file share, especially if you just have like documents and stuff that you wanna share on your network. And you might also wanna do backups. We have our Asus store on the network, so you can totally go do that very easily by just importing that as a share and we're ready to go. One of the nice things with Proxmox is that backup is super easy. It's built in and uh, you don't need other like third party tools to go do it. Now, if you wanna do other things like have a little Kubernetes cluster all built up on this thing, there are plenty of guides on how to go do that. You have plenty of CPU, memory, networking, storage, all that to go and build a Kubernetes cluster on here. Overall though, this is an awesome little box for a server. Now let's talk about power consumption real quick. Um, so we have a load that is running on this that we're running at about 75% load right now. So the CPU is being pretty taxed, I would say. Okay, and so real quick, uh, we, we, this thing is now turned on and uh, you know you can hear it's it's not very loud. It's not silent. You can you can hear a fan if you go right up to it, but if it's sitting anywhere away from you, you're just you're just not going to hear this thing. In our 34 dBA noise floor studio, we're now pushing around 35, 36, 37 dBA, something like that. So this is still running very quiet, even at 70% load, which is awesome. In terms of power consumption, our idle power consumption is now up to about 11 watts, which is much higher than it was when we just had our base configuration. And right now we're running in our 70% load or 75% load configuration. We're running at about 42 to 45 watts. 
Okay, so for all these, I like to have key lessons learned, but for this one, I think we're gonna change that up a little bit. I wanna show you just some of the other things you can do. So for example, if you have the 10 gigabit ethernet, you get, a lot of people are saying like, hey, I'd rather have SFP plus because that gives us access to like micro tick switches. I totally get it. Um, but if you do have 10 G base T and you're looking for something that's relatively inexpensive, we have uh, this new Hasavo unit over here. We're gonna have a second one that's arriving uh, later this week, but this is a eight port managed 10 G base T switch that we're gonna do a review on pretty soon. This thing is only $245. We're waiting for the PoE version, which is coming, but uh, this thing is an awesome value, especially for you know a 10G based T switch. And I know there are gonna be a ton of people that are gonna say, hey, Patrick, you could use um, mini PCs, for example, and you do a lot of reviews of mini PCs. Why are you not using one of those? Well, I think that these things, if you're gonna go and start doing things like replacing components, I think it's nice to have one of these HP units where it's fairly straightforward and you can keep everything internal and the power consumption is pretty good. I just really like these for that application. But yeah, you could totally use something else. Pretty popular, of course, is using something like an Intel Nook. I think my challenge with the Intel Nook is frankly just that these things have gotten so loud now that the power on the Intel chips has gone up. And when you're in this like little small form factor, there's only so much you can do. You need to have a fan running. And when you get up into like, you know, using 90 watts on the CPU or something like that, you need to have a fan running pretty fast. And that's why I think these things have become pretty loud. And there are other units too, and not just Intel. For example, you could use this little Geekcom AS6, which is also a Asus PN53 or something. Uh, we're gonna have a review on that one probably on the STH main site in a little bit. And then there are other ones like, for example, the B-Link units, and you're gonna see we have two GTR7 Pros. The GTR7 review non-pro is uh, is probably gonna happen and that system's actually being tested right now, which is why I couldn't uh, unplug this one. But these systems also can run two internal PCIe Gen 4 NVMe SSDs. They have two two and a half gig ethernet ports and frankly a pretty fast CPU and GPU. They also cost quite a bit more and you're gonna end up replacing some more expensive components, which I think is a little bit of a bummer. But one of the big things is like, you know, how do you get 10 gig ethernet on a system like this? And I think the way that you're gonna get 10 gig ethernet on something like this is you're gonna use a USB 4, you know, instead of Thunderbolt 3, you're gonna use a Thunderbolt 3 10 gig ethernet adapter. And um, and you can get SFP plus ones and also you can get, you know, 10 G base T ones and all kinds of stuff. So I think that there are options for using one of these. But at the same time, this thing costs over $300 more than the little HP unit that we got used, even though it's relatively new. And to me, I don't know if I would wanna spend that extra $300, especially if when we ripped out all of the memory to get our 96 gigs, we ripped out the SSDs to put our two four terabyte things in there. And also using a external Thunderbolt adapter means that we have something that you can easily unplug versus something that's a screwed in 10 gig ethernet port on this, which I tend to like a little bit better. So would it be a bad idea to use something like this? Absolutely not. I would just offer that instead of the GTR7 Pro, I probably use the base GTR7 if I were gonna go do this. At the same time, I just wanna do something fun with the Project Tiny Mini Micro Series. And also just get to show you what a base level, a kind of mid range, and then also a pretty high end system looks like. Hey guys, I hope you like this look at a monster Tiny Mini Micro Node. Let's face it, this is a one liter PC that is pretty darn quiet. It has a ton of capability, really rivaling a lot of like the Xeon E5 V1, V2 servers that are out there. And yet it's small and it sips power. And hey, if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with some of your friends? You can also so join the STH YouTube channel so we can have a little bit of support to go buy components for these. You can give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. And as always, thanks for watching and have an awesome day.